John Mulby was a British psychologist, and he became extremely interested in child-mother separation during the bombing of London. The bombing of London, a lot of parents sent their kids to the safety of the countryside. And the kids were with safe people. They were well cared for. They were well fed. But they still had a very negative response to the separation from their mothers. At that point, he looked at the biology that was emerging in primatology. A monkey infant gets almost all its nutrition in the first two or three months of life from its mother, from lactation. But the infant who's weaned still seeks proximity. You'll see the infant reach out and touch the mom's tail or touch its coat. There's a continuing lifelong desire for proximity and contact. And Bowlby and others have seen that proximity seeking and that contact seeking as being cornerstones of what they call attachment behavior. In the first part of the 20th century, behaviorists and psychoanalysts claim that babies love their parents because you don't want to bite the hand that feeds you. The innovation of Bowlby was to observe that that can't be all, that what the child needs is not only to be fed, but also to be held by an understanding, sensitive, and responsive adult, and that optimal social and mental health outcomes will follow from that and 60 or more years on now, we have a half century of evidence showing that he was more or less right. Our program at the Center for Babies, Toddlers, and Families is really based on the theories of John Bowlby with the idea that we really need to help parents and children form a secure attachment. So oftentimes, families are referred to us when the parents have had very difficult childhoods themselves and are really struggling in this role of being a parent. I, like I said, I never had a mommy. I, I was never taught how to take care of anybody or myself. So it was like very hard. Like I wouldn't have patience, like the crying, like I would, you know, scream at her and stuff like that, you know. And For many parents who, who really were neglected as children, hearing a baby cry triggers in them their own feelings of that unrelenting crying that they did. So for Pearl, it was very, very difficult for her to be able to meet her child's needs. Push it, push this button. Yeah, hard, push it. We've partnered with the Center for Attachment Research at the new school for a series of attachment measures to test that our intervention is effective. So come on in, Pearl. That's going to be your chair. So just put her down and let her have a go at whatever she wants to do in here. Okay. okay? We measure the attachment relationship with a laboratory scenario that takes 20 minutes. The critical point is where the mother gets a cue to leave the room. Bye, baby girl. See you later. Some children look on the outside like they're very independent and seem not to notice, but physiologically are very aroused and stay aroused even in the presence of when that caregiver returns. By contrast, the securely attached child often notices, cries when the caregiver leaves, and when the caregiver comes back, easily turns to the caregiver and looks to the caregiver to be comforted, and then they can get back to some kind of homeostasis. Okay, you play with them. We think this response is one of the hallmarks of mental health. No. What is so interesting about childhood development is that we know a lot about the long-term, lifelong consequences of early life adversity, ranging from psychological effects like substance abuse and depression, but also biological consequences like increased incidence of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, 
and a whole host of other physical ailments. One of the things we know that can lead down the path towards cardiovascular disease is chronic inflammation. Inflammation is a biological response that helps the body counteract an infection. The body produces chemicals which activate the immune system and allow it to get rid of the infective agent. When the infection is contained, the body calls forth cortisol to try to turn down the inflammation. Now, this is all good, but there are situations, especially connected with traumatic experiences, in which that cortisol response doesn't happen. So these people who had these adverse early life experiences had elevated levels of inflammation, which is at the heart of cardiovascular disease. So cortisol is very important. The way that we measure cortisol is through a saliva sample obtained upon arrival at the lab and at the end of the lab visit. And our goal is to, over time, impact patterns of cortisol. Wow. Is that OK? Yeah. Our initial measurements of these families when they were beginning the intervention, we see very low levels of attachment security as measured by their behavior. But when we look at families who have participated for six months or more, we see attachment security at 70%, the same level seen worldwide. There you go. Because higher levels of attachment security correlate with more normal cortisol responses. We're hoping to see their cortisol levels change as a result of the intervention. You love it, mommy? You love it, mommy? The main thing was it helped me a lot to focus on my child. You know, like, before I couldn't tolerate the crying and it would make me crazy and I used to be depressed. But now, I mean, sometimes I can't take it, but, you know, I know, I know better now. What have we learned from the studies of early life adversity? What we've learned is to take it seriously, that these are real biological issues. That early attachment is vital to everything else that happens something that is an inevitable part of who we are as human beings.